Hello and welcome to this episode of the Star Wars Universe Podcast. Today we're talking about the Clone Wars Season 1, Episodes 11, 12, 13, and 14. How are you folks doing today? I'm joined today by uh, Riki and Sarah Hayashi. How are you guys doing today? Hey, we're doing good. Aren't you going to say your own name? Oh yeah, I suppose <laughs> that. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Matthew, um, Matthew West Fox. I am your... Uh, other co-host, um, co-host of this, the Star Wars podcast, as well as Superhero Ethics and Orville podcast. Um, you guys may have also heard me doing another set of podcasts, another set of episodes on on this with Jeff Randall about The Mandalorian. We switch back and forth between that, and today we're talking about The Clone Wars. Um, Ricky is a person who I kind of half-inspired, half-twisted his arm to watch this show, and we've gotten some uh, good conversations between all three of us out of it. Yeah, sorry about that. It's just some, I've I've noticed recently because I've been listening to a lot of Pokemon Go podcasts. Okay, <laughs> a lot of the hosts don't introduce themselves. Yeah, so I'm left wondering like who are these people? <laughs> or even like one of them will just say, you know, today we have on the line these four people, and you won't ever know which voice is which. Yeah, so I'm gonna try also to like <laughs> say your names when I respond to you. Okay. Even though I, I believe we have distinctive voices, I think it's always good to reinforce who who each other are. I like that. I like that. Okay. Well, so let's kind of dive in, because today we have um, two episodes that I think are kind of on the weak side, um, although pretty fun, and then I think two of my favorite and kind of most serious episodes of the show. Um, so let's start today with uh, episode 11, Dooku Captured. And for those who have either seen the show, but not in a while, or aren't haven't seen the show aren't planning to see the show but still want to know what's going on here's a quick summary during their own attempt to kidnap dooku anakin and obi-wan discover that the sith lord has already been captured by pirates hondu onaka and his gang of pirates hold dooku captive in their den on florum and hold him for ransom it is up to anakin and obi-wan to see if the offer is too good to be true um so what you guys take on uh, episode 11 here uh, so I, 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 I like that it introduced Hondo. Um, we were introduced to Hondo um, a, a bit earlier than this. He's a he's a character in the Smuggler's Run ride in uh, Disneyland, oh, kinda... and I presume Disney World. Oh, that's kind of um, cool. Yeah, so it was neat to know that he wasn't, he, like, he was a character coming from somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was it was a fun episode, but not, I don't know. Well, the first half was... Terrible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the first half was just Obi Wan snark directed at Anakin mm-hmm. as as they like go through a series of adventures on this planet and fight a monster and stuff. Yeah, I I I agree with that idea of this being a fun episode, not necessarily a good one. I don't think we learn much about. I, I Hondo is one of my favorite characters in the show, and I will I will say it's kind of a mild spoiler. He he does um come back many times. Um, I think he's actually introduced in the movie. Um, the movie is quite mm. bad, and so we skipped it. Um, but certainly, um, and I, I like it because it it helps to further flesh out the idea of the people who are not in the war between the the clones and the and the droids and all that, and are just kind of trying to eke out their own survival, or in this case, you know, make a buck out of their own things. <laughs> um, and I just find him really funny. Um, now, I know also we had some thoughts on uh, who he was exactly. Um, uh, Riki, I think you added some notes on this. Well, the, the, so the whole character of Hondo Onaka was very strange to me, mm. I guess, because he seems to be coded as an Asian character, right? Like his voice sounds somewhat Asian not quite as stereotypically bad as the Neomodians. Right. Uh, and his name itself sounds kind of Japanese to me. Yeah, uh, on- sure. Onaka, in fact, is just a word in Japanese that means stomach. <laughs> and then Hondo, uh, you know, is yeah. is similar to Honda. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, I, when we were first introduced to him, I was, I was like, is this character supposed to be another one of these kind of pseudo-Asians in the, in the galaxy? Right. And then so I did a little research and discovered that the voice actor for this character is actually Jim Cummings. Very Asian-sounding name. 
<laughs> he's he's an old white guy, uh-huh. but he's, he's an old white guy <laughs> who played Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's a so it, a very famous one. stretch. Yeah, well, he's done he's done other voice acting um, as well. I can't think of any others other than like Tigger, which is not the, the, right. a huge stretch. But yeah, I, he's done more than just Winnie the Pooh. He wasn't the original Winnie the Pooh, I don't think. Oh, I don't know. It, it, yeah, he was in the uh, Christopher Robin, and mm-hmm. I guess some of the more recent cartoons. But yeah, but he he does a lot of voice acting work, and I couldn't really find anything like an interview with him on why he chose to voice Hondo in this way. Mm-hmm. And, and it gets stranger because the other character, the other members of his gang, who his pirate gang, who are of the same race. Um, I can't remember their race off the top of my head. But they are, um, we see them in Return of the Jedi as, like, crew members on Java's sail barge. Yeah, they're the people who are kind of running things. They seem kind of just, like, general desert-type people. Yeah. Um, But, like, his lieutenant, I guess, Mm -hmm. his second-in-command, has a vaguely Australian accent, (laughs) if I recall. So, I, I, I couldn't figure out why, you know, why is Hondo seem asian and then his second in command is australian so it's not like a racial component or maybe they grew up on different planets i don't know but it's it struck me as strange because in star wars we often see like an entire race is you know coded a certain way racially from from our perspective like all of the neomodians are asians you know all of the gungans are have like this jamaican accent yeah yeah and there's no real like planet um, not like Earth, right? Where we've got different countries and different people coming from different countries. The whole planet is all one species, right? Basically. Sarah's looking it up now. I think I remember. I think they're weak way. Yep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you got it. <laughs> yeah, obscure facts. <laughs> yeah. And- well, I was. Go ahead, Sarah. I was. I was. I was actually looking up to see. So when, as I mentioned before, my first introduction to Hondo was in a in a ride in Disneyland. Um, <laughs> But, yeah, where he was Captain Jack Sparrow. Yeah, I, so I was looking up to see if he was, because like, I was, I said to Ricky, I'm pretty sure, like, this is an old Captain Jack Sparrow uh, animatronic figure, just because, like, the way he moves, and he had, like, kind of the dreadlocks, too. Oh, that's interesting. And then, so it was weird, it was weird to see him in the the show, though, which obviously predates the ride at Disneyland by a significant amount. Right. Yeah. Um, did to, to see him have that like same look? I was like, oh, I just assumed they were like reusing parts to like make this new character. So it's a yeah. Didn't have to change a thing. <laughs> Didn't have to change a thing. Yeah, it's interesting. I I am. Um, there are definitely ones that I I I walk away with being very coded. I I I would admit I didn't pick that up on Hondo, but I think you're definitely um you're you're um uh noticing more than I am. The the general kind of sense I had was um kind of just of like general Asiatic um. Oh, Himalayan was really what I was thinking. Like the the nature of the way they act and and behave. Um, this is an awful parallel that is probably again nothing that is in any way um, sensitive to the culture trying to represent. But what I kept thinking of was the scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark, where um, they go to a town uh, high up in the um, uh, Himalayan mountains in what I think is supposed to be Nepal or Tibet. Um, that was the kind of energy I was getting from that group. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously more desert than mountain, but that kind of more um, sort of Central Asian. Um, but yeah, I think I think it's... it's. I, I always wonder to what extent is it... Like the Neomodians and the Gungans seem very intentionally coded. With these, I wonder how much it is a specific attempt at coding as much as just a laziness and lack of any sensitivity. Um, with the idea of we just need to kind of come up with some sort of background for everybody, um, mm. which I don't think makes it better or worse. Or I think it just is a different perspective. Uh, uh, might be just like a different w- way they're approaching it. Um, you know, I mean, still bad either way. Um, Have you found something, Sarah? Yeah. So, so he's in a comic book, and I was just wondering if he first was in the comic book. So that's why maybe he like had a certain look and then a different voice because he was in the comic first. But that's not true. So mm. cool. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know. It's it's neat. Like I, I mean, it's also like there's only there's only so many intelligible accents, I guess, yeah. that we can use, and it, like Clone Wars seems very. 
against the idea of subtitles, which makes sense because it's aimed at kids um, who maybe don't have like the the, the best on screen screen reading ability, right. or at least like that usually comes later than than just being able to like listen to a language. Yeah, um, I, I was having a similar thought about wondering if maybe part of why we're seeing this so much more in Clone Wars is is because of exactly that because they don't want to have lots of alien races that just sound like they're having an alien language. And so mm-hmm. instead, but we still want to make them seem different. So we get weird accents and then those weird accents all wind up being coded in some way. Yeah. I don't know. But I mean, like, I, I still like Hondo a lot as a character. Mm-hmm. Oh, he, he's a great character. Yeah. What do you, what do you like about him? He's just so like, I mean, he has a, a, a sort of, captain jack sparrow energy to him which might just be me conflating two things <laughs> that was a but, very powerful uh, ride clearly <laughs> well no i mean it was but it, in the same way like they're both pirates they both have dreadlocks anyway um uh he's he's sassy and like seems kind of incompetent but actually is very smart like mm-hmm. he's he's sort of got this play at like whoops i accidentally kidnapped dooku huh um when really he's like masterminding the whole thing and then secretly poisoning people along the way. Right. Or attempting to poison people. Yeah, I, I really enjoy the fact that he he just he doesn't seem to care about so much so much of the things that the whole rest of the show has approached from such a position of melodrama. To him it's just like clones, Jedi, Sith, I just want to get paid. Um mm-hmm. I found that very refreshing in a way. Um as well, well as just kind of a nice sort of reminder of like um you know, the original movies have a lot of that kind of like many people don't care about this great fight against the Empire in a way that I think most mm-hmm. of the show till now hasn't. Um, and so I do really appreciate that about him. And, 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 and just the humor. I think this episode is one of the first times I've really laughed out loud uh, a number of times during the show. This is very much, in my opinion, kind of the third pillar of Star Wars. Mm. You have the rebels or the Jedi, you know, the quote unquote good guys and you have the quote unquote bad guys, the Sith, the empire, but there has always been this third pillar that has supported and stood in between those two sides, you know, Han Solo, Lando Calrissian right. from the novels. You have Talon card from the uh, shadows of the empire. You have dash Rendar, like these smugglers or these kind of underworld people who, most of the time, you know, they're out to get a buck, but they're not quite evil. Right. And they often do end up siding with the heroes to, to take down the true evil as long as they get their, their share, their cut. And, and, even and, and when Hondo they, fits that. And, and even when they don't, someone like Jabba the Hutt or Boba Fett, like they're, th- those are much more antagonists than protagonists. But they're still, they're, they're malicious and cruel and terrible people. But you're right, it's, it's out for a buck. It's not because they care about the Empire or anything like that. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's a good point, especially because um, I, I think it's really interesting that in a lot of the games that have come out, especially the miniature games like X-Wing and um, uh, um, Armada, uh, not Armada, but certainly in X-Wing and some of the other games, the, the there are three factions generally you can play. You can play as the Rebels, you can play as the Empire, or you can play as Scum and Villainy. Um, which I think is just such a... That is, and like, that's the official title of the, the, you know, of the group. Um, and so I like that. I, I mean, I thought of it that way, but the third pillar makes sense. Um, yeah. And the Mandalorian yeah. is, is exactly that as well. Mm-hmm. Right. Very much so. Yeah. It's very much about the, and it's, it, it's a nice reminder. And I think it's an interesting, um, it, it, it's something I think that all four of the episodes we're going to talk about today get into, especially the last two, but you know, a nice reminder that sometimes the war that seems to be so all encompassing to a lot of folks there's a lot of people who either don't care or don't know or are just suffering because of it and aren't really on one side or the other. Yeah. Now, now, Ricky, what was your take on a, um, the, the view of a, a, a cousin of some sort of salacious crumb? I know he's a you mentioned <laughs> our first episode, a favorite character of yours. Oh, yeah. So I, I looked it up. These things are called Kowakian monkey lizards. OK. <laughs> so now we know that. I, I didn't know that. I don't know. It's. It's less uh, to me. It's less fun, I guess, because it's animated. Mm, that's fair. Part of why I love the original Salacious Crumb was because it was clearly, you know, a Jim Henson puppet. Yeah. And it, and it, the Return of the Jedi came out around the same time, 
as you know, Labyrinth and Dark Crystal. And it just, I, I loved all those movies. And so it carried on kind of that puppet tradition for me. I can see that. Yeah, so the, the, the salacious beat crumb lookalike uh, sort of sits on, on Honda's shoulders, mm-hmm. uh, similar to like a parrot, and then like, a, like an old time <laughs> pirate would have. Yeah. Because he's Jack Sparrow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so I think I think um, the last thing about this episode that I will say because it, it, we really find it out in the second episode, um, but uh, towards the end, Obi Wan and uh, Anakin are drinking with their new buddies in the pirate crew, and everyone seems to be happy. And they recognize that some pirates are trying to drug them and kind of outwit the pirates. But then it turns out, still take a deep drink from drinks that wind up being drugged, and they wind up starting out the next episode having been drugged. Did you have a moment of thinking, wait a minute, Jedi are really not supposed to be this stupid? Well, it it seemed like they, yeah, it was just weird that they actually switched because like it clearly shows the two pirates pour the poison into the cups and hand them to Anakin and Obi Wan, and then they use like the Force to like flippy flop some drinks so they each have new drinks. So I I was just confused as to like, oh, why were those? Dr- drinks also drugged i i have a different take mm-hmm. i thought it was just kind of a reference to the princess bride where i have put uh, i have put the iocane powder in both drinks right in this case it's not because it's a poison and he's immune they're just pirates having a good time and this booze is that strong it's not <laughs> it's not poison it's not you know a drug they're just getting drunk and they all pass out. <laughs> that certainly seems possible. But I, I thought that we've established that in this world, one of the weird force powers the Jedi have is that they're so in tune with their own bodies that they're pretty much immune to poisons. Um, no, get, come on. I, I, I seem to recall something about like the Jedis and toxins and like being able to purify their they bodies. They can't get toxins. drunk? That might be it, you know. You might be there. Never, I'm never becoming a Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> it, it certainly would make staff parties a lot less fun. That's for sure. It's See, like the Flash, right? The Flash can't get drunk because his metabolism, yeah, metabolism is too quick. Too uh-huh. fast, but they did give him like a very super, super strong alcohol <laughs> one so that he could get drunk. Uh huh. But yeah, I mean, it definitely. And I mean, the way Hondo has some sort of line at the end of episode 11 when he's leaving that heavily implies y'all are gonna drink poison right um and then yeah just just watching them pour it in so yeah i mean it could just be all the drinks are that strong Mm -hmm. it wasn't poison at all and they've they've still passed out but yeah it's i was a little confused as to how they Mm. they woke up having passed out perhaps it's left a little ambiguous because (laughs) it is a kid's show yeah Yeah. because on star (laughs) trek we get we learn all about uh you know Klingon blood wine, Romulan, Romulan ale, ale uh, what's the Cardassian stuff? Canar. Uh-huh. Yeah. Everyone's got their own alcohol. Right. Yeah, maybe Star Wars. I, I don't. I don't think I know a single thing about alcohol in mm. Star nope. Wars. Yeah, and I guess introducing the concepts of roofies to kids is maybe not <laughs> what this show wants to do. Yeah, probably. <laughs> well, so, so let's talk about this episode, and I'm sure it's going to be a favorite just based on the title, um, Gungan General. Mm. Um, Our old favorite is back. Uh, Episode summary from Wikipedia is, Anakin and Obi-Wan have been duped and are being held for ransom along with Count Dooku by the pirate chief Hono Anaka, Hondo Anaka, and his second-in-command, Turk Falso. While Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Dooku unsuccessfully attempt to escape, the Republic sends the ransom via a special envoy, including Representative Jar Jar Binks. Mm. When Falso tries to steal the ransom from his boss by shooting down the shuttle, the only survivors are a squad of clones and Jar Jar, who is the most senior officer alive, because that's pretty much why the, the, the Republic falls, has mm-hmm. to take charge of the mission. It becomes a race against time as Jar Jar rushes to deliver the ransom to take custody of Dooku and save the Jedi. So. I snickered earlier because of the name Turk Falso. Yeah. <laughs> for, for the second in command. That's not the we, most subtle been... name we've ever heard. We've been watching this Netflix series called The Toys That Made Us. Uh-huh. Um, and it, it's just about, like, toys from your your past and how they came to be. And the Transformers episode was great because they named all, well, 26, I think it was, uh-huh. yeah, something of like the that. original Transformers in a weekend. 
Yeah, and like Turk also definitely has that like guy sitting at a table throwing out like yeah. Uh, Quick, we need a name for a slightly villainous person. Yeah, I mean when you consider how many episodes a season they're putting into this, and they're probably not you know hiring the most expensive best writers in Hollywood for this show, especially season one. There's a little bit of you know plumbing the bottom of the depths that I can imagine with with the the naming and and kind of like some of the accents and stuff we talked about. Yeah, yeah. And even, like, this character, he, he does not... I mean, Turk Falso doesn't appear much after this? Is this the last we see of him? I think so, yeah. I I don't know. I'll have to pay attention yeah. when we get our future Hondo episodes. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, just uh, the, another, another Jar Jar episode is always demoralizing. And yeah, the... the, the I mean, it's still even... Okay. I'm gonna get a sentence out, I promise. Um, when they realize that Jar Jar is now the most senior in command, all the clones seem to instantly know that this is terrible. And right. This is a very bad thing. And so it's just like, why Why is Jar Jar being sent out on these missions? Period. <laughs> like, it, it makes no sense to me. I think it is no. just a, they like the character, they thought kids, I mean, and oddly enough, I have met now a number of people for whom their first introduction to Star Wars was you know, the the prequels when they were little kids. And they all say that they love Jar Jar as a kid. And yeah, well, I mean, I was one hmm. of those people. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. You talked about that. So, yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. it's that's the thing that people wanted to see. So I guess it's what we have to deal with. But um, they they do have a new voice actor for Jar Jar, um, which I found my take on it was that he wasn't quite as annoying, but he was harder to understand. Um, but also that meant he was kind of a plus. Um, what was your kind of take on uh, um, this new character, this new voice actor? I didn't even realize it was a new voice actor, but I think that's because I just try and block every Jar Jar moment out from my brain. That's- I, I thought it was. So the the voice actor is, is less extreme, right? Yeah, he seems it's more kind of guttural and less like sing-songy. Yeah. Um, so it, see, it, it sounds more like an actual patois than a um a parody of one um which is both i feel like it's it felt less stereotypical like more more like someone might who might actually have some experience in that cult in those kind of cultures rather than uh, a white person trying to make fun of it but also as i said let harder to understand Mm. yeah i mean so we always watch with the subtitles on just that's just how we like live our lives these days i guess Uh apartment living and all that um so, yeah, I don't know. I never had a lot of trouble understanding him, but also I don't know if I would still be saying that if I wasn't reading right below what he was saying. Right. Um, and, yeah, not trying to actively <laughs> I, I don't, block it off. I don't remember there being much else in this in this episode to comment on. Um, some kind of fun moments of Dooku and the two Jedi. A little bit kind of exploring their past and learning more about the fact that um, Dooku was you know, once a powerful Jedi and was a, men- you know, a master and a mentor to people. And we learn a little bit more about his backstory. But other other than that, I don't really think there's much else in this episode worth commenting on. Did you, do you guys take much out of it? Well, Matthew, like my favorite part of the Jedi thing uh-huh. was just Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan's character is so delightful because he's an equal opportunity I don't know, snarkatician. <laughs> I like I mean, that usually term. we usually we see him just dishing it out to Anakin. The oh, like sarcastic, roll my eyes, Anakin. And this time we see him doing it to Dooku. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it, and it's just fantastic because I mean, I presume Dooku is more powerful than Obi-Wan. Right. But it show kind of shows that it it's not just him uh kind of you know, hazing his apprentice or former apprentice. Yeah, yeah. He's that's just to this is just who he is. No, Obi Wan yeah. has resting sarcasm face. I mean, I think that's pretty <laughs> clear. Yeah, I mean, I I love Obi Wan snark, and I still insist that he and Anakin have better chemistry than Anakin and Padme ever will. I think that's fair. But... I think that's fair. Um, <laughs> I I will also say, have you guys seen the movie Birds of Prey? No, we haven't. So it is very good, and granted, uh. Ewan McGregor does not play. Um, uh, what Ewan McGregor's in it? Yeah, so, so hold so, up, hold up, hold up. Ewan McGregor is Obi Wan in the live action prequels, and he's not in the um, the TV show. But the character in the TV show is so clearly based on that particular version of, of Obi Wan that that's what I was think of. 
Okay. And Obi Ewan McGregor's not in the movie Birds of Prey, though. No, he, he is. is. He's the villain. He's the oh. Black Mask. He's okay. And he he's looks nothing like what you expect. It, it is just such a like stretch as a character actor. It's fantastic. Wild. Um, but um, with that, why don't we move on to the next two episodes, which I think are, um, like I said, are two of my favorite. I'm curious how you guys see them. Um, and they're they're kind of one big storyline. So maybe we can just kind of um, talk about the two of them together. Um, the first is called Jedi Crash. Uh, and in this one, Anakin is – actually, they're, they're a little bit different in the thing. So maybe let's just start with the first one. Um, Anakin and Ahsoka arrived at a pitched sky battle to help besiege Jedi General Ayla Sakura. Anakin is gravely injured in the fight. Ayla and Ahsoka, along with the now-wounded Anakin, Rex, and the surviving clones, crash land on the uncharted, grass-covered uh, planet Maradun. Forced to leave Anakin behind in order to save him, Ayla teaches Ahsoka why the Jedi have no personal attachments. They make their way to a Lerman village. Their ruler, Tiwat Ka, explains that they are pacifists in this war and not aligned with either side. Hesitant to have anything to do with the Jedi, Ka agrees to help save Anakin's life. Um, so I feel like there's kind of two different things going on here. One is all the stuff about the Jedi, and one is all the stuff about the Lerman. Um, l let's go to each one of those in turn, but I want to start just kind of general. What are your guys' thoughts on this episode? Yeah, I, I really like this episode. I think I agree that, I mean, the first two were not amazing, but these two are actually pretty good episodes. Um, yeah, and I, I like this one. Mm -hmm. it, it's a little heavy-handed, yeah. I think, with, with some of its messages, but I mean, again, it's 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 got kids' show pass on that, I think. Right. Uh, I thought this one was okay. Mm -hmm. I, like, I like the next one better. Yeah. Well, yeah, because like, I think the the Lerman stuff starts to get introduced here, but it goes into much more detail in the next one. Um, let's start just then with this Jedi question, because I think this topic of uh, attachment has obviously been a really big one throughout. And so far, we've mostly just seen it in terms of Anakin and how attached he is and how that keeps getting other people and in, not, into not only into trouble, but a lot of times getting people killed. Um, what's your kind of take on how it now is between Ayla and Ahsoka? in terms of the, this question of attachment and what is or is not right for a Jedi. Yeah, well, they... Um, so Anakin's hurt, so they have to leave him behind, basically, at the crash site in order to uh, go find help. Um, and Ahsoka's insistent that, like, she's going to stay there with her master. Um, and yeah, then Ayla's, it basically tells her no. But I think it, it's also framed... It's less framed in a, like, we don't have attachments, be cold and uncaring, and let's get out of here. Right. But I think she she says something like the the way the best way you can help him is by coming with us and trying to find people because they have there's like they crash land and then there's indication that there's some other living creatures on the planet based on like a, a tree that they see or something right. So I, I think it's less it, it seems a little watered down right like it's not just a straight up attachments are bad and if you stay here this will get you killed. Right. And this is why attachment is bad. It's like the best way that you can help him is by leaving him right now and coming with us. And we're going to leave a clone to take care of him, I believe. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And on some level, it's not just about attachment. It's also just about understanding of your own ability to influence things. Because mm -hmm. I think part of Ahsoka feels like, you know, she can't, she can't leave him because he's dying. And so he needs her. And mm -hmm. and part of the point I think is that she can't do anything while he's dying. Like yeah. he, her being in her mind, he's in trouble, so she has to be present. But part of the realization is like there's nothing she can actually do there. And um, a she can help him best by going off to um, try to find help, but also she can help everyone best. And to some extent, it, the, there there does I, I think there is some level of like you said help Anakin. But there's also some level of the good of the many outweighs the good of the one. Mm -hmm. At least I think from uh, Ayla's perspective. Why can't she help him? I, so from the Mandalorian, <laughs> yep. we now know, and maybe it's not just the Mandalorian, but Force there's users movie, but can yeah. heal people. Yeah, so it showed up in the Mandalorian, and it seems like it was an, the episode that was released right before the release of last Last Skywalker? Yeah, Rise, Rise of Skywalker. Skywalker. Rise yeah. of Skywalker. Which you're right, where it also appears that Jedi can now be healers. 
Yeah, but it seemed like they released that Mandalorian in an episode early on purpose to be like, uh, see, we've established it. Like, is there any other case of Jedi's? I have to guess them? that some of the video games have force healers, and I, I, I think it is something that exists, and it, mm-hmm. it's something that should exist right. because if you have a connection to the the force, which is life, and you can manipulate it, I, I, I don't mean like you can just like heal wounds. That's that seemed a little over the top. Yeah, but I feel like basic, you know, not CPR, yeah. but like basic care for right. someone what about kissing someone and bringing them back to life yes i mean that's, that's in there okay star cool. wars is now owned by disney and the magic mm-hmm. power of a kiss is a very established disney trope <laughs> so <laughs> i guess they kind of squeeze it in that way yeah i mean i i loved it yeah and there were people in it was very polarizing there are people in our theater who, who did not love it but i was like uh, keep kissing and have babies and live happily ever after. My, my my booing was not quite as audible as some other people's, but it was <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty much on the opposite end of the fence there. Um, well, now, I don't know what's going on. I don't know where all this is coming from, but I keep seeing headlines where, quote unquote, oh, yeah. Star Wars, like the, the franchise is, is declaring things kind of like post movie. Oh, God. Very like they're, line. yeah, like they're Pottermore. Uh huh. And one of the things I saw was that Star Wars says that the kiss was not romantic. It was just a friendship kiss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then Emo, Emo Kylo Ren, the parody account, responded with, wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Way to put someone on blast, you know? Like, we're just friends, <laughs> Kylo. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, I have thoughts. That seems a very Dumbledore's gay kind of thing. I think your Pottermore yeah. comment is accurate. Well, the um, other the other one was they declared that Ray's father oh was God. a Palpatine clone. Yeah. So I oh mean, at least God. with it's just getting getting ridiculous. Yeah, the, but this seems like harmful ridiculousness right now. Whereas like the Pottermore stuff and like Matthew was talking about the like Dumbledore is gay. Yeah. Um, it's like I had diversity. It's just you didn't. I didn't talk about how this person was black, but they yeah. were the whole time. Look how inclusive. Yeah, are. this is more like the the wizard poop. Yeah, we, wizards used to poop in their pants. Yeah, yeah which is not. So anyway, anyway, back to the Clone Wars. <laughs> Welcome to the Harry Potter podcast. Yeah. <laughs> there will be more of Gosh. that. I've never read any of the books or watched any of the movies all the fun. way through. Good. Uh, um, I, yeah, I'm going to make a like sound you... of horror and then I'm going to edit it out. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So um, <laughs> uh, the Lerman. Yeah. Let's talk about the. Oh, yeah. What? what I, oh, go ahead. Sorry. To answer Riki's question that occurred before the wizard poop. Um I think the reason that she she doesn't stay behind is, like, first of all, she's a Padawan, so even if force healing was possible, she's not the one who's going to be doing it. And also, she's demonstrated some sort of tracking ability by... So they crash land by this tree, and there's, like, fruit in the tree, but the fruit have fallen, and she sees that there's tracks, and they try, the tracks lead off somewhere. And Ahsoka's the one who pieces all this together, that mm. there must be a race nearby who's utilizing this in some way. Right. So I think part of the reason why it's, like, you're... Where you're we're going to best use our resources by having you go try and find these people instead of stay here with Anakin is like explained in that. Right. That does make sense. Um, but yeah, the Lerman. Yeah. So, um, I, I love these folks. Um, and I, (laughs) particularly because this is the first, and, and we'll talk about where their story goes in the second episode, but I, I really loved having, you know, last time we saw someone who didn't want to have be in the war because, they just wanted to make a buck on all sides, and they didn't care. And mm. now here we see people who are actually pretty philosophically uh, opposed to the war. And one thing that I really like is that they're, at least in this episode, they're not portrayed as, like, weak cowards. They're portrayed as people who have a very strong philosophy and who wind up actually asking some really hard questions of the Jedi. Um, mm. I I wrote down two of my favorite um, uh, quotes, one of which is, um, and they both come from uh, Tiwat Ka, and at one point, because he, it, he I, I love him also because he's also so sarcastic. Like, he clearly has his perspectives, <laughs> but he just loves to needle people. And at one point, they're talking about how, you know, they are these great warriors for freedom and peace. Um, and he says, freedom and peace require violence and death. Um, and then later, in, in another kind of exchange like that, he just sends, you know, you are no peacekeepers. Um, what was what was your take on the Lerman and how, how the kind of questions they raised and how they're presented? I mean, aside from the delightful Irish accent. Well, yeah, that's also. I mean, yeah, they're kind of like mu- not muskrat, but what what's 
meerkats yeah they're like little yeah or like um oh shoot like uh i, I the thing that the crap brothers had and zabumafu was it lemurs oh lemurs yeah and, which was, i think is where a bunch of words i know i'm sorry <laughs> that was like a little like early naughties trip um well, and, and I, lerman i think is like a play on lemur maybe yeah even? and and i will say i love their irish accent because again kind of going into coding the wit the the visual mm. the visual aspect of their life and them being Lur- lemur like it very much comes across as like the the stereotype of like african brushland tribal um and so for them to have irish accents i thought was such a nice way of kind of undercutting that a little bit um yeah and I think it's also like an interesting sort of cultural commentary on like the IRA and the the sort of North North Ireland versus is the other one just called Ireland mm. Republic of Ireland Republic of Ireland yeah um, and this idea of of yeah the sort of embroiled battles and also it's it's just cute yeah <laughs> I think another point up there but yeah um, Tiwaka and his son were also introduced to mm-hmm. or is that in the next episode I think the son's in this one a little bit. Um... He's he's much a bigger figure in the next one. Yeah. Um, well, the son is also much more willing to help the the Jedi when they sort of just wander into the village as well. Right. And sort of that idea of like the younger generation is more accepting and more tolerant. And Tiwaka is, is real set in his no war, kindly leave, please and thank you. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, this is. I, I feel like this is very relevant to the times mm-hmm. of twenty. 20- 20 is that the year yeah (laughs) um where a lot of my friends um in the in the u.s you know liberal friends talk about punch nazis right right and my personal philosophy is probably close to pacifist or non-violence and i don't want to talk about punching nazis or, or advocate violence against other people even if they're bad people. But I recognize that if you don't punch Nazis, Mm. they will take over your country and kill people, possibly like me. So there is a need for violence when you are confronted with violence. Yeah. You you can't just roll over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the second episode really digs deeper into that. Yeah. For people like me who don't want to be violent, like I still have to support the people on my side who are willing to use violence. Uh, otherwise, you know, we don't stand a chance. Yeah, and it's interesting because I'm 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 going to kind of <laughs> not disagree with you from both directions, but but just um, uh, sort of seeing it in, in other ways because I I am more on the punch Nazi side of things than you are. Um, but I but I also I think that like you said, there's a need for both. The only place I think I disagree with you a little bit is that I do think that there are times and places where you 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 can be utterly nonviolent, and I don't mean like Martin Luther King nonviolence. I mean like Gandhi level of nonviolence, um, of uh, of pacifism, um, and certainly like you know Gandhi in India, it was successful. But I also think you're right that it's very much a um, that that doesn't work in all situations, and and you know Nazis in America may may very well not be the same thing. And as the next episode gets into um the the separatists coming to your planet may not be that um yeah well so gandhi i mean that's a situation the 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 british occupation of india where they were not looking to kill or at least not massacre right the the native population they were looking to subjugate them right and, and and enslave them and just take advantage of their their wealth so i think gandhi's methods there do have merit because right. you know if if you disrupt the the oppressor's methods enough then they're not able to extract the wealth that they they desire and and that's that's going to cost them if they're just looking to come in and kill you yeah you have to be right. you have to react with violence no and I, I think that's very true and i think that's um you know certainly both gandhi and martin luther king said things along the lines of that um part of the way that their strategies work is if the oppressor has some sense of shame and if you can mm-hmm. sort of, you know, make them realize that they have to use violence to enforce their power and bring about the sense of shame and that, you know, when there were slaughters of, of Indian civilians, um, you know, there's horrible out, out, uh, outcries in the British press and how that, that influenced things. And that, as you're right with Nazis don't have that. Um, 
and I think the the yeah. separatists certainly don't. The- yeah, and I I think this plays out in the next one where mm-hmm. initially when the separatists come, it looks like they just want to occupy the planet, right? And it's like okay, we can live with that and continue on with our our nonviolence. But when they literally start testing a murder weapon, they're like, uh, I guess we have to fight back. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I, I let let's get into the the synopsis of the next episode, Matthew. Definitely. Um, yeah. So the next one is uh, episode fourteen, Defenders of Peace, um, which I think is is again is a very intentional um, play on Tiwat Ka's comments before about you know how do you how do you fight for peace? Mm-hmm. Um, Tiwat Ka refuses to shelter the Jedi from arriving separatist forces fearing that such an action would unnecessarily bring his neutral people into the war. Ahsoka, Ayla, the wounded Anakin, and the rest of the clones respect their wishes as they do not want to jeopardize the village with their presence, so they have to retreat into the wilds of the planet. Separatist Neomodian general Luke Dard uh, arrives to test a devastating weapon, which they plan to use on the Lerman. Ultimately, the Vigors have to decide whether they will lay down to the Separatists or fight with the Jedi to defend their village. Yeah, so... Uh, like Riki was saying, when the the separatists originally come, I think they're they even they say like they're they're conquering them. Right. I forget the exact wording. Um, but basically, yeah, they they they're implying that they're sort of going to occupy them. I, but I think you know, they say you are now be... you now have the glory of being under the separatist protection yes, or something it, like that. It, yeah, it seemed to be a, a very um like uh. Like oh gosh, why can't I think of the word? Sort of a, a caring, but um, condescending a relationship. Condescending, yeah, like a parental sort of. Yeah. But but demeaning, but not in the sense that like we're gonna kill all of you. Um, but yeah, then later until it, they do, until they do. <laughs> no, exactly, and then they turn around and start testing this. Um, like this seems like a great place to test the weapon. Um, George Takei mentions uh. George K is, is locked, which is like amazing. Uh, I, I think reports back that he's like, "Oh yeah, these people are rolling right over. This is a great place right. to test this weapon." Um, and the uh, Tiwatka's son, who was a pro Jedi when they came to the village, is now very anti separatist and uh, upset with his dad for yeah, basically just rolling over and allowing the separatists to come in. Um, senses that there's something not not cool with them mm-hmm. uh and then yeah the 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 separatists start testing this weapon which is meant to destroy all uh organic life right well and leave all the droids alive yeah which yeah that's a <laughs> that's a bad thing yeah um i want to uh, i want to get into this i, I want to start though i'm curious what you folks thought of um george takai uh, as uh, uh as this character I mean, this name is another one out of the grab bag yeah. <laughs> of we're going to throw some words together that sound vaguely bad. Uh-huh. I mean, it also, uh, back when we were first, we did our first pass watch of this, the the Nimodians had such, like, super stereotypical Asian accents. Um, and then just to have George Takei come in and do his very... Like over the top, oh my yeah. kind of <laughs> voice. It seemed really like, fitting, um, but still, I don't know, hokey, corny, I guess. Well, I mean, this this is how you you have to do representation, mm-hmm. right? Even though it's an animated series, you have a race that you've established is is Asian, or somehow Asian sounding, yeah. yeah. Um. And so you bring in a very famous, in this case, Asian actor mm-hmm. to do the voice. And even though he's not doing the the over the top accent, I mean, you can still recognize his his voice and his inflection and mm-hmm. his accent as genuine to to this culture. Right. Yeah. And and it's it's something that I have always noticed in the cartoons that I watch. Um, Batman the Animated Series was one of the first ones I remember as uh, when Batman goes to Japan and fights against a ninja that most it seemed like most of the Japanese characters were actually played by mm. Japanese people who were who were speaking authentically right 
which is in sharp contrast to to most of the stuff I watched back then, up to and including Karate Kid 2, Oof. where Daniel and Mr. Miyagi go to Okinawa, Japan, and talk, and he talks to people in Japanese, and it's just cringeworthy. Yeah. It's, it's terrible. Not surprised. Yeah, I, I, that, that's why I was kind of curious your thoughts on it, because I... I, that was kind of my impression, but obviously for for me as someone not not a part of that culture, I was I was going to be curious what h- how that came off, um, and and certainly I feel like that that point of representation is such a huge one because, and it I couldn't find the right words for this, but with something like Star Wars, where as we've said, these races are so clearly coded. You know, I, I I like what you said about representation there. That it's not that these are Japanese people in space, but it's a, a completely alien race, but that is coded in in Japanese culture and ideas. And and having someone from that perspective, uh, who under who understands that language and the and the voice and all that, uh, I, I can see why it makes a real difference. Um, probably still, yeah. I don't. I, I'm guessing this does not rescue the Emodians from the racist stereotype by any means, but at it least does. is better than what we've seen before. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, we, we instantly recognized his voice as George Takei because right. <laughs> it's it's so it's iconic, distinct. Yeah, but I, but so like talking about the Lerman, for example, mm-hmm. you know, we we're like, oh, delightful Irish accent. I personally don't know, you know, what an authentic Irish accent mm-hmm. should sound like. Mm-hmm. You know, it, these could be Irish actors; they could not be Irish actors. But I'm guessing that if someone from Ireland were to watch this show, they could tell us right off the bat, like, that's some American person, you know, right. faking an Irish accent. Mm-hmm. So to us, that doesn't matter. Yeah. But pe- people of that descent will notice. And that's why I say representation matters. Like, the people of that group will notice right. when you take the proper steps. And, and I myself, my family is not Irish, but I've, I've spent a year there um, and have been immersed in that culture for a while. It does not make me a member by any means. And I, just by my own fairly untrained ear, I would say it, it, it seemed about halfway between an authentic accent and um, a cereal box leprechaun. Um, so yeah. <laughs> closer than, 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 um, you might've hoped. Um, so yeah, what's, I, I had a lot of thoughts on this episode, uh, and, and how the Lerman are presented. And I'm kind of curious what, what's your take on how this plays out, especially given what we were just talking about, about <clears throat> nonviolence in the face of either oppression versus extinction. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I mean, it, it takes that heel turn when it, I guess heel turns maybe not the right way, but the, the twist when it needs to, right? Where, um, Tiwat Ka is is adamant against it with his um pacifism, right? But then, which I mean, he he seems to be fine with even under occupation. Uh, but yeah, when it when it becomes obvious that it this is more than just an occupation, I think it's even it, doesn't his son I think goes against him to to go get the Jedi and yeah, I mean he, to the very fight. end, which I think is interesting. Tiwat Ka ref- does not want to fight. He seems that he would be more okay with being obliterated than fighting. Yeah, but he seems he also like lets his son do it. Right. Kind of, he stops fighting against him fighting. Yeah, um, I think it's a fair way to put it. Yeah, and I, 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 to me, I think it's interesting because I think it it raises another sort of element to the question we were just discussing about the nature of nonviolence versus you know in different situations. Because to me, I. I, I feel like Tiwat Ka, he, he was always saying this to some extent, but he makes it cl- even more clear in this episode. It's not just that he feels like nonviolence is right unless we actually have to use violence. It's that he feels that in some way there would be another kind of extinction by using violence because it would be such a fundamental change and a, in his mind kind of a moral destruction of who they are. Um, sort of a stooping to their level kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I and I love the last lot that in some ways I was a little disappointed that it became such a black and white issue of like, they're utterly going to wipe you out. So of course you should fight. Yeah. Um, but I loved, uh, the last line is I think one of my favorite last lines in any of these episodes because they're all kind of celebrating and saying like, <clears throat> you know, look, we won. It was the right thing. And Tiwat Ka just says, but I still wonder at what cost, um, which to me was a very haunting sentiment. Cause on some level he's sort of saying like, yes, we lived, but, what is our culture now? Um, mm-hmm. And he's not outright saying that it's better if we all die, 
but it does sort of seem like he's saying on some level, like, I don't know if it's better if we all live, if we have to do this to live. Um, yeah. But it does, it also seems very much like he's, he's sort of the old guard, right? And he's stuck in this culture's maybe even antiquated belief system. Right. Um, and this reluctance to change would have gotten him killed. Right. Um, and whether that's like, sort of the strong moral principle or um, stubbornness, I guess, mm-hmm. is, is kind of depending which which side you're looking at it from. Well, it's similar to what Batman goes through. <laughs> With the no guns thing? Yeah. Well, no guns slash no killing. Right. Mm. Right. Like, it's not nonviolence. He's, Batman is very violent, yeah. but he refuses to kill anyone, you know, mm. up, up, up to including the Joker, who multiple times commits such atrocious acts that many of the characters around him are saying, you have to kill him. Like, right. you have to stop this. And he's, no, that's, that's the line I'm not going to cross. Yeah. And there's, um, I forget which episode, which, um, issue it is, but I know there's a particular comic book where, Wonder Woman in a similar situation does kill someone um, because there's a sense that this person will continue to go on killing. Um, and her and, and Bruce Wayne really kind of have a conflict over it because oh, um, he's... I, I can tell you. Oh, yeah. Please, please tell us which one it was. <laughs> so, so that's from the Justice League. Um, Wonder Woman kills Maxwell Lord, right. who has the ability to control people with his mind, mm. and he becomes so powerful that he's able to control Superman. And he he flat out tells Wonder Woman, the only way to stop me is to kill me because I can now control Superman so I can do whatever the heck I want. So she she breaks his neck and actually does it on TV. And this leads to a lot of ramifications of, you know, the world's trust in Wonder Woman and the Justice League. Right, that's right. And ultimately leads to a rift in, in the Justice League that some villains take advantage of. Yeah, I remember that. It's and it and it's a powerful story, and it it, it but it's yeah, it's another interesting. It's an interesting question because Nerd. it becomes, I think, tw- twenty years ago, I was very much an idealist, and I was very much of the like Tiwat Ka would have been my person. Like I was very, I, I thought of myself very much as a pacifist and an idealist, and there's a part of me that still holds that kind of ideas, and it's kind of why I'm sort of sad that Tiwat Ka kind of comes off as wrong. Mm. But but I also feel like part of it is that someone like Wonder Woman or Tiwat Ka's son just feels like they're more aware of what the actual world is instead of, as Sarah, as I think you said, kind of stubborn and stuck in his ways, which maybe is more like Bruce Wayne or uh, in that situation. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of I agree with you, Matthew. Like, I think I, I consider myself a, a pacifist and uh, like 10, 12 years ago, like staunchly, staunchly so. Um, and like, I still, like, I still oppose like the death penalty, Mm -hmm. but, um, this idea of like completely nonviolent resistance being the only way to, to get what you want and, and sort of keep the moral high ground, I think is, first of all, it's like a pretty privileged position to take. Um, but yeah, and it, it is very, very black and white. And I think in the, in an ideal world, uh, it would be great. If we could all just use like totally nonviolent tactics, but that's not where we are. Yeah. Um, and there's still so much gray area. Any other kind of last thoughts on this one? This was heavy. Yeah. It, it's, a, <laughs> it's a very heavy episode. Yeah. We could talk about non heavy stuff. Sure. Like go for it. <laughs> Lockter and his weapon. Yeah. It's a. So well, I, the I. Weapon is. Sorry. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say is is totally ridiculous, but you seem I think like you have something more articulate. Well, no. I, so this character, I believe, it, I don't know if he shows up later in the series, but there's some stuff written about him that suggests that he might have had a hand in the design of the Death Star. So he's I he's like a proto uh, Galen Erso. You know, weapon designer within the Separatist forces. Right. Yeah. I'm pretty sure we see Lockdur again. At least I recall hearing George Decay more than once. Um, but yeah, I don't know if we get into that that lore about mm-hmm. certainly Death Star engineering. And I think this kind of goes back to what we we're saying also about him being less of the stereotype. And part of that I think is Decay's voice, but also he seems like a much more avuncular character. You know, the other Neomodians are very 
they come across almost in in um I, I'm evoking this term because of the the negative stereotype that it has in this portrayal. Not that it should have a negative stereotype, but very effeminate um, and very sort of like hmm. not wanting to get their hands dirty and wanting the clones to do all the fighting for them, um, which I think is part of what makes them so problematic. Lockter doesn't seem like that. He seems like he is much more comfortable with the militarism of the position he's he's holding, um, which I think was another thing I found kind of refreshing about his character. Yeah, interesting. I never, but he's also a coward. Yeah, well, I was gonna say I never really thought of the Nemodians as having a particularly like effeminate quality, but they seem very like bureaucratic in in the same way you're talking about Matthew of like not wanting to get their hands dirty, right? Um, but more in a like they just like sort of a fat cat kind of mm, sense, I like a. a well, I, I was gonna say like th- this is one of the few. I mean, other than like the huts, right? Like he, his oh, yeah. character is physically, yeah, is large. Yeah, yeah, that's also quite true. And it, it's it's not something we really were used to seeing in a in a fantasy cartoon setting. I think most you know, of the mo- uh, yeah, most of the emodians, especially, are presented very kind of tall and thin. Yeah, these are most characters, right? I mean, certainly all of the Jedi are are fit individuals right yeah, if you see other like, than yoda yeah. <laughs> i mean i guess yoda's fit but not yoda. tall <laughs> yeah yeah if you see big characters they're usually like bulky muscly or yeah the huts right and that sort of yeah Cor- yeah never really thought about that so I, yeah I, maybe i'll have to watch this episode again and specifically watch for this but i like i wonder if they played off of that in a comical way you know which is not great but being being a cartoon, like I I think you we're used to seeing larger characters get portrayed like that where they're where they're clumsy and they just fall over, mm, right? Yeah, the Pratt fall. Yeah. Well I think no but beyond Pratt falling, like speaking of I guess cartoon fat cats, I mean they're uh like Governor Radcliffe from the Pocahontas movie, which is a a whole other barrel of problems. <laughs> but like Oh, sorry, <laughs> the cat just jumped away. Um yeah. Uh, so Governor Radcliffe in the Pocahontas movie uh, is this very like he's he's fat but he's very like um, he's gonna dictate how everybody how how, how everybody's gonna work but he can't help you because oh he's got back problems but you guys should dig real hard and like mm. yay for England um, and just wants to sit back and like get all the gold and get all the glory for himself and like leave his peons to do the dirty work mm-hmm and I feel like that's a similar, like, similar vibes from the Nemodians, or, like, they just, they, yeah, very bureaucratic. Yeah, I, I think that's legit. I, I, I guess the feeling that I have is that the rest of them would never even bother going down to the planet while the fighting mm. was still going on. But you're right, it's still, it's not maybe a huge shift from where the others were. Oh, mm. sure. So the fact that he he's riding in the tank. Right. Yeah. In the front line. Yeah. But it's but it's not a front line, right? Like from his perspective, this is a safe weapons test. Like he wasn't really expecting there to be Jedi and for there to be opposition. Right. He's thinking yeah, this is basically like it. barely sentient life in, the, in their kind of perspective. Mm-hmm. And like you droids go run in front of the cannon and make sure that it doesn't kill you. Right. <laughs> Which is yeah, a little yeah. The the, the continuing way that they treat the droids. I mean. And that's what their purpose is in this canon. Yeah, but they're given such personality. Like even the two droids standing in front of the canon, they're like, I, I, I mean, they're they're wacky, but they're like, uh oh, are we about to be murdered? Yo, I, I will say, um, not to bounce over to, to promote the other part of this podcast, um, but mm. one thing we talked about recently on the Mandalorian podcast, which I know you guys have seen that show, mm-hmm. is that there's a couple of scenes where in flashbacks we're seeing. Uh, dro- separatist droid armies attack the home of our our you know and uh, protagonist character when he was a little boy, mm-hmm. and in that they're portrayed as terrifying, mm-hmm. and I really loved getting to see the droids in a completely non comedic, completely non pratfall, just looking like terrifying metallic weapons of death. Um, mm-hmm. and I, I always think about that now when I go back to see the the pratfalls on this of like. Ugh, doesn't have to be this way <laughs> like yeah and we get we get a like taste of it like um a few episodes ago when 
Ahsoka and Anakin ran into the IG-88 units. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or the IG units, I guess. IG-88 is a specific robot. Anyway, um, he's not a robot, he's an android. Oh, no. I feel the comments coming after (laughs) Um, (laughs) But yeah, and and so they see the the assassin droids who are designed to assassinate. But yeah, these little battle droids are just, yeah, dorky. Yeah. I think it's, that's, and I'm sure that's a topic we're going to keep coming back to throughout the show. (laughs) For sure. (laughs) Um. So on the subject of other media, um, I have my partner waiting for me to watch the last episode of season one of Westworld. Um, oh my. Another interesting discussion of uh, robots getting violent. Robots. <laughs> um, yeah. But do we have any kind of last thoughts on these episodes? Or before, actually, we have a couple, uh, some business to do about fortune cookies. And um, mm-hmm. But any last thoughts on these before we get into that? No, I think it's fortune cookie time. All right. So first of all, um, on our last episode, we had... Um, uh, uh, as always, Riki collected some fortune cookie wisdom as well as the wisdom of the episodes and asked Sarah and I to guess uh, and gave you all a chance to guess along at home. Riki, how did we do? Okay, so let's see. Downfall of a droid. You both got that one correct. Okay. Uh, it was trust in your friends and they'll have reason to trust in you. Okay. Duel of the droids. Sarah got it correct. You hold on to friends by keeping your heart a little softer than your head. Aww. Matthew, <laughs> you were tricked by fortunecookie.com. Uh-huh. Use your head, but live in your heart. Yeah. It's not from the episode. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I just wildly stabbed. Uh, Bombad Jedi, you both got it correct. Heroes are made by the times. Okay. Cloak of Darkness. Uh, you both got it correct. Ignore your instincts at your peril. Nice. Okay. And then Lair of Grievous. Matthew, you got this one correct. Mo- most powerful is he who controls his own power. That's <laughs> ridiculous. That is the actual Clone Wars quote. Uh, <laughs> oh and goodness. Sarah, you were tricked by discover the power within yourself. Because it seemed less ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree. No, in this case, okay. the fortune cookie was less ridiculous than the actual TV show. So. Wild. So you tied. All right. okay. For this one, let's just so, yeah. let's get the answers uh, uh, live, but we we can try going back to the guessing one uh, for our, our audience at home next time. Sounds good. Yeah, I so I also have been looking away at the the blue big blue letters in space mm-hmm. so as to not influence myself for these fortune cookies. Okay, so are you ready for this week? I'm ready. Episode eleven: Dooku captured. The key word here was peace. Quote number one. Today, it's up to you to create the peacefulness you long for. Quote number two. The winding path to peace is always a worthy one, regardless of how many turns it takes. Okay, I'm going to say two just because number one seems quintessentially fortune cookie. I think that's where I'm going. Can you read number one one more time? Uh, Number one. Today, it's up to you to create the peacefulness you long for. Yeah, I, I feel like most of these aren't as much like today and you. So I think I think the second one is from the episode. <laughs> All right. Episode 12, the Gungan General. Keyword was fail. Quote number one. Failure is not defeat until you stop trying. Okay. Quote number two, fail with honor rather than succeed by fraud. Oof. Oh no, because Jar Jar's whole thing is succeeding by fraud. Yeah. This is a tough one. Number two feels like it's a little bit like smacking you around more than a fortune cookie would be. So sure. I'm going to again say that number two, I think, is is the episode, not the fortune cookie. I think you're probably right, but I'm going to go with number one, just because it seems counter to Jar Jar's whole character. Yeah. Okay. Episode 13, Jedi Crash. The key word here was fear. Quote number one. Fear is the mind killer. Greed and fear of loss are the roots that lead to the tree of evil. <laughs> The tree of evil. Yeah. Okay. 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 Tree of evil. Quote number two: Conquer your fears, or they will conquer you. Tree of evil, all the way. I don't think there's a tree of evil in Star Wars, so I think I think I don't think there's a tree of evil in a fortune cookie. (laughs) I mean, it's 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 fairly Western iconography, that's for sure. 
Um, but yeah, I. But I mean, so are I guess fortune cookies are invented in San Francisco. Uh, yeah. Also legit. I I think that the fortune cook. I think Tree of Evil is the fortune cookie. All right. Okay. So wait. I'm I'm saying Tree of Evil is the quote. Yep. All right. Matthew's disagreeing with me. He's anti Tree of Evil. Anti Tree of Evil. All right, and finally, episode fourteen, Defenders of Peace. This one was hard to find a keyword. The keyword is surround. Surround. Uh, quote number one. When surrounded by the war, one must eventually choose a side. Quote number two. People in your surroundings will be more cooperative than usual. Obviously, number yeah, one. Yeah, number one is very on the nose for you. And, and it... And it it's, I almost wish that I had known that that was the quote because then that makes me even more angry that the episode is making a point that I don't like. <laughs> um, yeah, because like he chose a side. Yeah, he chose the side of like nonviolence. That was the side he chose. Right. No, you uh, have to choose. You have to you choose have to good cho- or evil. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. see. So yeah, I, I think are number you, one is clearly it. Yeah. Are you going to reveal our results now, or are we going to no ne- next week? Right? Okay. I'm going to give the. The listeners a chance yeah. to chime in. So again, listeners, yeah. uh, please, uh, please uh, chime in. You can tweet your answers at us. You can Facebook the answers. Um, please do guess if you've looked them up or if you have them memorized. Um, you know, maybe keep that for yourself. <laughs> Who has them memorized? Uh, you know, I, I, some of our fans are very dedicated to the show, and I want to honor that. Uh, I might make also, fun I of it like... just a little bit, but mostly, be mostly honor that <laughs> uh, and be a little envious of it. But yeah, you can find us on. Um, uh, Facebook or on uh, Twitter or email at Gmail uh, at Star Wars Universe Podcast. The links to all of that is on our show notes. Um, uh, thank you guys so much for being a part of this. Um, also on our show notes, you can find more information about all three of us, as well as the fact that this podcast is part of the Stranded Panda uh, network of podcasts in which people, uh, myself, as well as a number of other uh, great people, dive pretty deeply into a number of different uh, movie and cinematic uh, and TV properties. We have podcasts about the Marvel Universe, the DC Universe, the Orville Universe with myself, the Star Trek Universe, uh, a number of great podcasts on there, and a, a one that has just um, gotten uh, launched called Bingers Assemble, which is about um, binge-watching a series of movies to get ready for the newest one. Uh, and currently they're going through every X-Men movie that has come out, every live-action X-Men movie that's come out uh, in preparation for the new one that's coming out, I believe, this summer. So uh, please check those out. Please give us a high rating on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. It's a great way for people to find us and, and uh, hear our podcast and broaden the conversation and bring more voices into it. So, Ricky, Sarah, thank you guys so much for being, it, being here. Listeners, thank you so much, and uh, have a great day.